Well, welcome back to the Virtual Canadian Executive Leadership Conference. My name is Mark Belaish. I'm president of torontojobs.ca and torontoentrepreneurs.ca. I uh, hope you've uh, been uh, getting a number of uh, learning uh, topics uh, here today at the event. A lot of great speakers and uh, we got lots more to come. Uh, this speaker, great topic, uh, five decisions to help your business succeed in the digital first economy. Ramesh Hatirachi is commercial lawyer with Signal Lawyers and he's going to share a whole bunch of great to great topics and uh, great tips for you in your business. So Ramesh, welcome. Thanks very much for being here and take it away. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, first off, this, I, this is a great opportunity. I thank, I thank uh, the organizers so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, so uh, like Mark said, I'm, named, I'm, I'm Ramesh Shetty Archie. Um, I've been practicing commercial law for about a decade now. Uh, basically focus on helping business owners adapt to the needs of the digital economy. And so um, by way of background, um, I'm a commercial lawyer, decade of legal practice. Um, my focus has been to provide practical, uh, proactive legal advice that's really focused on solving problems, minimizing risks, and basically managing legal processes of Canadian business owners. Um, I'm a writer for entrepreneur.com. Uh, and I'm also a board member of the, of the Entrepreneurs' Organization Accelerator Program. And this presentation here is really based on my experiences in these different capacities. Um, Entrepreneurs' Organization, for those who don't know, is basically a global organization that empowers entrepreneurs with the tools, accountability, and community to aggressively grow and master their business. Um, I was, I became, I got onto their board early this year. Um, it's really transformed the way that I look up, um, that I think about uh, how to grow a successful business. And I'm looking forward to sharing some of the insights with you today. Um, so this is an article that I actually wrote um, a little earlier uh, this year called The Five Trends Fueling the Rise of the Digital First Economy. And in the article, I talked about what the digital first economy is and the five trends fueling it. And so you might ask the question, what is the digital first economy? And simply put, the digital first economy is really um, an idea of or the practice or the economy where profitability of a business is really linked to the access and utilization of technology to deliver, to deliver digital experiences. So in more in, in English, the economy where purchasing decisions are made based on the initial online and digital interactions interactions of the, of the purchaser. And it's really being fueled by five trends. The first trend being the rise of mobile, um, and especially in the pandemic, mobile smartphones have always been foundational to how our lives, how we interact with each other and how we buy things for over a decade. And today customers now rely on mobiles and cell phones to make purchasing decisions and even to participate in the in civic life. So see, for example, um, QR codes right now in restaurants where if you don't have a QR, if you don't have a QR code scanner, you can't access a menu or even vaccine certificates. Vaccine certificates now are something that you have to deliver via mobile. Um, there you have to get where, again, you present the QR code to the restaurant or to the, to the event space. They'll take a picture of it and that's how you can get access to a space. Um, we, you as a business owner really need to be thinking about how you're delivering value to the mobile devices that customers already have access to. And if you're able to do so, you're creating competitive advantage in your business over that of your competitors. I also talk about the rise of social media. Basically, social media and technology has become a way of creating new relationships and new connections, which is so critical to, be, to running a successful business today. The rise of video. Video now is everywhere. If you look on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, video is one of the biggest drivers of consumer content now. The rise of e-commerce, we're no longer walking into retail stores, we're making purchasing decisions based on um, accessing a website and browsing around and clicking links and going to a con and checking out. 
and then the rise of um, digital customer experiences. Your digital customer experience is now going to be more critical for when customers are making purchasing decisions. And if you do not understand the journey of a customer digitally through your business, you're much less likely to be, be successful doing business online. So the question that arises now is what decisions do you need to make in response to these trends? And that is what I'm going to be covering over the next 10 to 15 minutes. What are the things you need to be considering as you're building out um, these set of events uh, under top of these trends? So let's start off by talking about the one major factor. What are the risks facing your business in the digital first economy? And you can divide them into two categories, the financial risks and the non-financial risks. So let's start off with the financial risks. What financial risks does, does, is your business exposed to in this new world? And you can talk about our suppliers increasing the costs of goods or services provided to your business, or what will happen if you increase your pricing? What, how do you minimize the impact? <coughs> and maybe what are the consequences of not increasing your pricing? Um, these are some of the things that we think about from the financial end of things. You should also be thinking about what are the non-financial risks your business is exposed to. These may consider like are the needs of your customer changing or how is the digital first economy changing the behaviors of your ideal customer? These are some of the things that you need to be considering really early on in the stage of your life cycle. And by the way, if you guys have any questions, just drop a link into the chat and I'm happy to try and answer them on the fly or over chat as, as the case may be. Um, and, the second thing you need to be considering in, new, in this new world is how do you integrate new revenue streams in your business? And I'm specifically going to be talking about three different types of revenue streams. The first revenue stream is what we call joint partnerships. Now, joint ventures and partnerships are where you see alignment with somebody else in terms of offering a similar type of pro uh, like um of a product that is not competing with yours, but adds on as a significant value to the same consumer base, or you both want to do something together in order to create revenue for both of you. Creating new partnerships with joint ventures is a really great way to build more revenue. I highly recommend it as a lawyer, but it comes with some areas of risks, risks that can and should be covered up in a contract. So if you are looking at exploring creating new partnerships and creating new, new joint ventures, I highly recommend that you think about putting some of this together into a partnership agreement or a joint venture agreement. Now, the second type of um, thing you'd be considering is subscription-based pricing. Now, what are subscriptions? I mean, subscriptions are everywhere now, and it's really a more modern way of how you're gonna be doing business. And what you're doing is you're providing defined benefits to someone else on an ongoing basis in exchange for a recurring fee. Now, in order to be successful with this type of approach, you need to be providing significant value to each subscriber on a regular basis. And you're building out a subscriber base. And you're continually attracting new subscribers to compensate for attrition. You'll then want to build customers on a recurring basis and retaining each subscriber for as long as possible. So you're getting as much value out of the customer and you want to keep cost of attrition as low as possible. That is the key essential to subscription pricing. It's a really great business model for really modern and innovative business owners. I highly recommend that approach if that's something you're thinking about. The last model I want to talk about for revenue streams is licensing. Licensing is the idea where you're allowing someone else to use your confidential or proprietary information for a set period of time in exchange for an agreed fee. Now, some keys to success here, you've got to own your IP, that IP has got to have value to somebody else, and then you want to make sure that that licensee or that other party is gonna protect the confidentiality and the proprietary uh, of that information for as much as, for as long as possible. And what you want to do is you want to generate revenue that's sufficient enough to continue the development of that intellectual property. 
that is the in essence what we're trying to do with licensing now those are the two pieces that you'll be thinking about there now let's go on to the third um what decision you need to make and that is key performance indicators so what are the key performance indicators that drive the success of your business let's start off by talking about what a key performance indicator in fact is so a key performance indicator is in is something that uh, if someone can just i just realized can I just if someone can just put a quick message in the chat just to make sure that they can hear me um i've just got a message on my computer saying there's a possibility that people won't hear me um so it's, if someone can do that i'd appreciate it um Okay, perfect, thank you. So what are key performance indicators there? The activities that you're tracking to help you evaluate how well you're progressing towards a certain goal. Um, now, you, there's this idea of you are what you track. That is the idea that we're talking about here. Um, if you are not tracking it, there's no way to know if you're doing well to going progressing towards the goal or vice versa that you're not. And so what you want to do is always be tracking your performance at all material times. So um, and there's two aspects to, um, for, to um, KPIs. One, they have to be meaningful. And second, they have to be linked to a certain goal. And second is they need to be measurable. You need to be able to track the indicator objectively. So let's talk about some examples here. Um, how are you creating, uh, identifying, creating? First, you've got to know what you want to achieve. So that's, this, is basic, this is basic goal setting. Now, you can say, like, look, I want to have a certain amount of leads or sales calls done within a certain period of time. This goal can be organizational, departmental, or role-specific. So organizational role may be I want to achieve X amount of revenue every single quarter. That's a goal, Okay. Departmental uh, might be, I want um, thousand widgets to be sold <coughs> in um, computer accessories within within a certain period of time. Or role specific, uh, I want my sales team to, to conduct five different presentations in a week. Right. You're then setting measurables that are relevant to each goal. So, for example, for sales. You might say it's a number of leads, the number of phone calls, the number of presentations, the number of follow-up calls. These are some examples of some measurables you may want. Uh, when it comes to orders, number of orders fulfilled, customer satisfaction, you might choose a metric such as the net, net promoter score. Again, these are just some examples of, um, of uh, KPIs you might want to measure here. Uh, by the way, for those that are in the room, there's a bit of a poll that's out there. If you can answer the poll, I'm gen genuinely curious who, kn who knows and understands what a digital first economy is. Um, so now that, you, now that you've identified a goal, you want to create a time period for it to be tracked. So again, are you going to be tracking your goals on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, quarterly basis? Um, in, in entrepreneurs' organization, which I'm a board member of, um, we track goals on a daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis, right? There are some organizations that will talk about an annual, and annual for me is a little too long. I really like setting quarterly goals because that's a much better way for me to be measuring the performance of the organization. Um, so, yeah, so those are the four elements. So you're knowing what you want to achieve, you're setting measurables that are relevant to the goal. You then create a goal and the time period for the goal uh, to be reached, and you're just tracking the performance on a defined set of period. Um, so that is the four that's the third element of um of the decision you got to make when we're trying to pivot to succeed in the digital economy once you've got a strategy you're then going to think about what changes in the workforce you need to be making um in order to execute your strategy so what changes in the workforce does your strategy strategy demand and i'm going to look at this question uh through d three different contexts First, what new roles and responsibilities need to be created as a result of this strategy? So if you are looking at a digital, as a digital first strategy, 
You might be like, who are the people that need to hire? What are the things that they need to create? What are the goals that need to be maintained? You may also be want to think about what are the roles and responsibilities that are no longer needed, that are redundant. And so these are examples like, um, we are no longer going to have a physical sales force that is knocking on doors. We're going to pivot and move it all virtual, right? That's an example of a change in workforce that for most, most people don't do door to door, door, door sales anymore. It's got an online approach, especially during COVID. And then you've got to be thinking about what are the metrics that are going to be capturing the performance of a workforce. This question is there because in this, in the realities in this new world, there's going to be a different way to measure how well your workforce is doing. It may no longer be how many doors are, are they knocking. It may be how many eyeballs that are being looked at through a digital ad. So again, what are the metrics capturing the performance of your workforce? If you are looking to hire or let go of people, you need to talk to an employment lawyer. And the reason being is that the law has changed over the last couple of years. You need to be very, very mindful of your obligations as an employer when it comes to their employees. So if this is something you're considering, I strongly encourage you to talk to a lawyer, uh, especially if you're trying to let people go and get them redundant. The last thing, the last decision you need to make is how you're going to grow your advisory team. Now, growing your advisory team is always a big decision, um, but I'm, I would encourage you to do so based on two lines of thinking. First, grow your digital advisory team. So these are the people who are digital marketers, social media marketers, web designers, even um, uh, fractional marketing officers, right? Who are the people that you can rely on to help inform your digital strategy, to expand the digital strategy? That's a digital advisory team. You then also want to grow your business advisory team. And that looks like your lawyers, your accountants, your controllers, your financial advisors. You, if you are looking to pivot your strategy, these are the people who really need to be informing your decisions. Pivoting isn't easy. It requires some strategic forethought. And it really is hard to do it alone. So if you're looking at doing so, I would really encourage you to try and grow your business advisory so you can make better decisions. And lastly, I'll call, I'll just briefly touch on the value of a trusted legal advisor. In this new economy, in this new world, trying to pivot will require some knowledge of how the your legal obligations are impacted by your strategy. And your and, a, and an experienced and competent lawyer will be very helpful for you to make sure that you're making the right decisions. Um, we talk about proactive legal advice, and proactive legal mind, legal advice means that legal advice that helps inform your future decisions, and not talking to a lawyer after you've had a bad consequence of a bad of a bad decision. Right? Um, it's kind of like um, I know for a lot of uh, business owners, lawyers are the last people they want to talk to. But the truth is, if lawyers can help fix things early, if you consult them proactively, it's much more expensive if you're trying, if you're consulting a lawyer after, after the fact, after the, the egg is broken. So I would really encourage you, if you're looking for proactive legal advice, find a lawyer who does so and act accordingly. Now, if you look at the chat, I've actually added a couple of links there of a small business risk assessment checklist. That's a free checklist that I give my clients um, to help basically assess the risks of facing their business. Feel free to click on the link, it's completely free. Just drop in your email and you'll be and you'll get the uh, download immediately. Um, if there are if if you're if there are any questions, I'm happy to address them now. Um, I'll take a couple of moments to see if there are any questions, and if not. Um, I appreciate the time each of you have taken for this. This was a really wonderful opportunity, and I thank the organizers for, for letting me be part of it. Uh, my, con my contact information is there in case you need it. It's romesh at signallawyers.ca. And if you want to book a call straight away calendar, it's go.signallawyers.ca slash bookrh. And that'll take you straight to my calendar. So seeing that there are no questions, um, I'll call it a day. Thank you again for the opportunity. I will talk to you all soon. Cheers.